Welcome, everybody, to episode 114 of Radicalized Truth Survives. Today, Jim Hi-Fi and I are interviewing Dr. Matthew D. Taylor. He's written multiple important books about religion and religious extremism, and he's a bridge builder in the world of theology. His latest book, The Violent Take It By Force, The Christian Movement That Is Threatening Our Democracy, is incredibly important. Today, we're going to be talking about Christian supremacy and how we can defend ourselves from that violent movement in this coming election. Dr. Matthew Taylor, thank you so much for being with us here today. We are so excited to interview you uh, for many, many reasons, but I do want to pause a moment and make sure that our guests notice that you have the best hair of any guests we've ever ever interviewed. I had to get that out of the way because it's so true. Well, you fab you. Fabulous <laughs> hair. Now, now that we uh, you know, got the niceties out of the way, um, I just want to thank you for all the bridge building you do, the work that you've done, the fact that you've reached across to different faiths, different denominations, and tried to bring people together in your work. I find that so inspiring because it's very much an, uh, you know, the antidote to so much of what we have been dealing with in uh, America during the Trump years. And where I would like you to start is with the title of your new book, The Violent yep take it by force. Can we talk about that first? Yeah, that uh, is a phrase um, that, according to the Gospel of Matthew, comes straight out of the mouth of Jesus. So um, the passage is Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Jesus is uh, speaking about the death of his cousin, John the Baptist, who was executed by the Roman Empire and its proxy, Herod. And, and he makes this very strange kind of cryptic comment um, almost an offhand comment where he says, um, since the days of John the Baptist until now, uh, the, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And um, Christian interpreters have been have wrestled with this passage over the, the centuries. What, what, is that, what does Jesus mean by that? Is this a descriptive comment that just to be a Christian is to experience persecution and suffering? Is he using a metaphor? Is he saying that Christians should be, it, it should endeavor to be violent in, in, in a passionate way to try to grab hold of the kingdom of heaven. Well, the, around the Capitol riot, as I've, as I've researched into it, this verse shows up all over the place in the social media feeds, in the commentary by the Christians who participated in January 6th. And in their interpretation, um, this is a mandate to do spiritual violence in order to bring about the kingdom of God. And in their perception, the kingdom of heaven was suffering violence in the form of uh, the, 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 the electoral process pushing Donald Trump out and in their perception of the election being stolen. And so they felt that they needed to be violent to take it by force. And they often would even add the word back in there, the violent take it back by force. And so again, the sense of that the kingdom of heaven was represented in the Trump administration, and they were so desperate to hold on to it that they were willing to go to quite extreme ends. Thank you for explaining that. And can you explain to our viewers how you found that reference in Parlor? Because I think it's really important as you were doing your research that you, like Jim and Hi-Fi, go right to the social media sources. Yeah, and I, I a lot of my um, research into January 6th has taken place on social media. Parler um, was a was a prominent um, kind of up and coming social media site that um, ran into trouble around January 6th and afterwards. But there's still archives of it. Um, I, a lot of my research was also just on Facebook. You you would not believe how much people leave in public on their Facebook pages about their participation in January 6th. Not so much the rioters themselves. The people who went in have have mostly cleaned up their their social media accounts because they've been prosecuted. Um, but the the folks who were on the periphery, the folks who were kind of surrounding the Capitol, a lot of them still have videos and, and, and postings about their presence there, commentary back and forth. And so that is where a lot of uh, my research has taken place, just trying to understand the influences on the Christians who showed up that day. What were the theological ideas? Who were the leaders that they were following? And, and what drew them to the Capitol that day? And that's really what my book is about. Thank you so much, Jim. I've got a million questions, but I know you do too. So you go next. Yeah. Um, thank you for your work. And uh, especially I, I saw your coverage of, of the latest um, NAR uh, convention 
<laughs> Spectacle. Uh, yeah, terrifying. Um, it, it reminded me of the Jericho March. I'm not sure if you're familiar yes. with that before the yes. January 6th, mm -hmm. um, which is basically run by by Mike Flynn and and had mm -hmm. a lot of that those Christian nationalist components, uh, including um, Archbishop Vigano. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm sure. Vigano. 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 Sorry, uh, he was just excommunicated who is Mike Flynn's personal priest, according to him. Anyway, so so a um, lot of very interesting crossover there. Um, but I wanted to ask you about uh, Rod of Iron Ministry and uh, and whether they crossed over uh, into your, your January 6th uh, research much. I, I, I peeked at them. And just by the way, the Jericho March was not run by Michael Flynn. He spoke there. But the 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 leaders behind it were it was it was a, a Catholic and a Protestant people and really it was mostly right. NAR leaders and other independent charismatic leaders who were really driving force. In fact, there was an event very similar to the event that I just went to on the National Mall in September of 2020. It was called the Return. Um, it was yeah. a gathering of of a lot of evangelical leaders, but it was really the backbone was a lot of NAR folks. And um, it, the, the leadership team and the speakers list from the return actually converted over after the election to become the basis for and, and the, the 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 core of the leadership structure around the Jericho marches as well. Um, so sure. Michael Flynn was an invite was invited to speak there for sure, and 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 said some quite wild things. But um, he was I mean, I, I, most, as far as I know, he was most of the people there were his. Specifically, his allies. Um, oh yeah, yeah. A lot of his allies were there. Yeah. The First Amendment Praetorians or personal guard, who are you know all in the speakers list. Jack Osobic and Tracy Diaz. Um, it was a, a whole bunch of QAnon stuff. In addition, which is sort of the 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 reason why I'm asking because the the convergence of of these QAnon type ideas with Christian nationalism, I think, is 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 a is not understood well enough. I saw you saw an yeah, yeah. interview with you earlier I, 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 where you talked about that crossover. I was curious about it. Yeah, no, so just on the rod of iron thing, I have not dug deeply into rod of iron. I've, I've looked at them a little bit. I know that they were a presence there. They, as far as I can tell, they are not attached to the NAR. They were another one of these kind of Christian no, totally. nationalist groups that showed up that day. There were a lot well, of they're, they're based on the Moonies. They're, they're from the Moonies. Right. Yeah, they Very broke good. off from the Moonies, yeah. from what I understand. Um, and and the there were a lot of Christian groups that showed up that day. Um, there were Catholic groups. There were even immigrant Christian groups that showed up that day. A lot of them coming out of um, kind of communist countries who were mm -hmm. um, kind of activated by this rhetoric of communism is going to take over America if Donald Trump does not wow. go back in office. Um, but the, the majority of the Christians who were showing up, the majority of Christian leaders, I've tracked 60 Christian leaders who all come out of this convergence of non-denominationalism, this kind of non-denominational governance, and then charismatic spirituality. And that's really what I'm trying to hone in on in my book is how, why is that sector so overrepresented on January 6th, so overrepresented among Trump's evangelical advisors? And part of my, my argument is that the New Apostolic Reformation, which operates within that sector of Christianity, is a very influential leadership network in that sector. Was, was a real kind of motive force for Christian Trumpism, offering a lot of the propaganda around Trump, surrounding him, uh, advising him. And, and they, they have become, in many ways, uh, the, the, the vanguard of Christian Trumpism. So you got a lot of like subsidiaries and all these little eddies, but they, they are very much in there. And yeah, QAnon was, was a big part of um, January 6th. There is some uh, quite a bit of overlap between kind of Christian nationalist sentiments and some of these kind of Christian and these QAnon ideas um, and QAnon discourse. I mean, QAnon is God, is, God wins is one of, is one of their big slogans, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I, I would say though, in my research, what I've seen is more coming into January sixth. It was more like there were distinct channels. Distinct yeah. media ecosystems, yes, distinct yeah. social media yeah. channels, funnels, and then and, and, and so you had this kind of independent charismatic. You had a QAnon, you had the Proud Boys oh, and Oath Keepers, the Stop the Steal. But then they all converge, right? Because they're all supporting Trump, and he has said, yeah. "Be there, we'll be wild," right? And so they all show up that day. Since then, there's been a lot more cross fertilization and cross pollination because yeah. they all got together. They were all talking. They were all hanging out together. And so the leaders have all gotten to know each other. And so you see in spaces like Flynn's Reawaken America tour exactly. how you can have this like anti-COVID, QAnon, 
independent charismatic prophecy. I mean, it's it's, it's just a wild wow. list of conspiracy theories. There are, but they've all kind of cross fertilized since then. Thank but, you uh, so much. Julie, Julie Green comes to mind. Uh, what one of one of the most curious uh, uh, NAR uh, prophets is is a regular on Flynn's tours and. Uh, uh, I, I, I find her endlessly. She's angry. the one who gets her prophecies from God on her well, cell phone. Correct? Well, I, that, that was going to be a follow-up question for yeah. later is, is how, how do these prophets, right? Because the basic idea here is that you have these people that are pretending uh, from my point of view to be channeling God and they're clearly getting their messaging from somewhere. Um, and I'm just curious if you had insight into sort of, how these individual prophets sort of come to, you know, say the same things, but in slightly different ways. Interesting. So um, I would not actually categorize Julie Green as part of the NAR. Um, the NAR was a particular set of leadership networks that Peter Wagner organized in the late 1990s mm -hmm. and early 2000s. Julie Green actually comes more out of what was called the word of faith movement that was sometimes more popularly called the prosperity gospel movement which is another again if we're thinking about that intersection of non-denominational and charismatic mm -hmm. that, that, that's this is a very amorphous world so word of faith oh. is one stream of thought within that um the the nar is one set of networks within that there's a lot of mega churches and televangelism channels these are all kind of a yeah, part that's of this why you're here, here these things up man thank you okay. yeah, and, and, and so um but i i actually think um but hey, yes, these people are very much paying attention to the political context. And if, if you watch over time, their talking points very much mirror Trump's talking points. I don't think that's because they're, they've got a back channel. I think it's because they, they are very much watching Trump and they're supporting Trump. And so wow. they want to echo and mimic the, the messages that are coming from him. I will also say, though, there, there's a distinct world of this independent charismatic prophecy. There's a whole culture around it, a leadership culture. And these, and, and, and when you're in that world, there's thousands of leaders globally and even hundreds, maybe even thousands in the wow. US who are part of this world, hundreds of people who are saying they are prophets, right? And all trying to say things about Donald Trump, all riffing on each other. Because it's not a world of clear boundaries, of very clear um, uh, separations, right? Word of faith overlaps with NAR, NAR yeah. overlaps with the mega churches, right? They're, 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 it's all kind of relational. These, the, the relationships among these leaders is actually what structures that world. And they're all doing conferences together and they hang out in the green room together. And there's a hierarchy, a social hierarchy in there. And so many of the NAR leaders that I write about in my book are kind of at the, at the very top echelon of that independent charismatic celebrity hierarchy. And so they have a lot, a lot of influence in through charismatic media. And this is not this has not been talked about in the January 6th report or January 6th committee. Most of the media has not paid attention to it. But charismatic media, it's it's a it's a subsect, a subdivision of Christian media. You only really touch it though if you're a part of that world. And that charismatic media was a major force in driving people to January 6th. It wasn't just OAN, it wasn't just Fox News. There, there, there were dedicated media streams built around these ideas of modern day prophecy. That, and you had these NAR leaders pushing these messages, pushing this propaganda into that space. But I will say, I have interviewed a bunch of these people. I've interviewed a ton of people who know them. They really believe this stuff. It is yeah. not, it's not that there is some kind of backroom cynicism, like, oh, well, we're, we're really pulling one over. They're, these are true believers. They really wow. believe the, that they are prophets. They really believe they're receiving words from God. They're often taking things that occur to them in their brain and baptizing them and saying, this is the will of God. This is a message from God. Yeah. And some of those come off very strange, but they're in their minds and in their belief system, they really believe it. And, and that is part of what brought them to January 6th was not just, oh, we see an opportunity for self-promotion or something. They were there because they believed they needed to bat battle back the demons that were stealing the election from Donald Trump. E even scarier that they truly believe it. Uh, one thing I want to ask you is you have described January 6th as the evangelicals 9-11. And can you sort of give us a more sentiment on that, on how you sort of came to that conclusion? Yeah, my, my first book, um, which was, was published with an academic press, um, is really about the Salafi movement in the United States. And Salafism is a, is a renewal movement within Sunni Islam. Um, often when people talk about radical Islam, 
um, they're referencing Salafism. And it, it's, it's a big global movement in the US, fairly small community. And after 9-11, that, that community experienced a, a lot of government crackdown, prosecution, mm -hmm. cultural mm -hmm. Islamophobia, even alienation from the right. broader Muslim community. And so I spent the last uh, five, six years really thinking about January, both the parallels between January 6th and 9-11, and because in that community, they, they especially most Salafis don't want anything to do with war and terrorism, but they watched as the symbols and theologies of their movement were weaponized by Al Qaeda on 9-11 to propagate this attack on the wow. United States. On, on, and, and these are American Muslims, right? This is their country that is being attacked. And then they get tarred and feathered as, as, as though they were somehow associated with that. I think that is similar to what I witnessed on January 6th. Evangelical symbols, evangelical music, evangelical Bible citations, evangelical theology were weaponized in large part by the NAR. There were other leaders who were doing it as well, but weaponized as part of this anti-democratic attack on the Capitol and on, on the, the institutions, right? On, on the institutions of our government, on the very process of our democracy. And I, I think there, there's a, a, the challenge that we have today is evangelicals still have a lot of power in our society and they have not reckoned with the, the role that evangelicalism played in January 6th. And in part, I think the, the media has not held their feet to the fire on that to actually think and, and deal with that and, and, and think work within their communities to figure out how to counter some of those voices. But I think it's also that they still have a lot of privilege and a lot of power, and they, they are able to use that to kind of foreclose the conversation and say, oh, I, that, those, those are just fringe figures. Except many of the people I'm talking about in, in my book are global celebrities. I mean, yeah. there, there, there were a lot of people who showed up on January 6th who, if you are in that world, these are A-list celebrities. Right. I want to get the term Christian supremacy and Christian supremacists into the language. Can you talk about uh, why we need to understand uh, what Christian supremacists are? Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of terminology floating on, around out there that I find um, vague and unhelpful. So, for instance, Christian nationalism. Useful phrase. It, it, it describes something. Um, but the problem is Christian nationalism is a huge spectrum. I mean, it's every it, Christian nationalism is everything from people singing God bless America in church all the way to storming of the Capitol or Christian terrorism. Right. Like that, that's all that's all Christian nationalism. Right. So I think we need to differentiate within that spectrum. What are the more benign, sentimental forms of Christian nationalism that I would argue have always been a part of American culture, at least a strand of American culture? versus these more weaponized, radicalized forms of Christian nationalism, which is what I would call Christian supremacy. And so Christian supremacy, by my definition, again, is it's the, the hardened end of the Christian nationalist spectrum. Um, it's often much more driven by theology than by just kind of sentiment or politics. The, 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 for, for the Christian supremacists, they have a theological idea that Christians are supposed to rule over society. In the charismatic part of the Christian supremacist movement, that's understood as a mandate from God. And they'll, they'll talk about the seven mountain mandate as, as a kind of program for how to enact Christian supremacy. Um, and there's also a, a kind of reformed side, a Calvinist side in the Protestant world of this Christian yeah. supremacy. So people will often throw around the term dominionist, and I think they're gesturing towards what I'm talking about with Christian supremacy, but I find the term dominionist to be vague. I find it to be something that is, it, it's very, if you're reading it for the first time, you have no idea what you're, what it's talking about. And I find that even the, a lot of the people who write about it and use it don't know what they're talking about. So I, I am trying to use Christian supremacist as a way to signal like, the, this is a more extreme form of Christian nationalism, and it gives us a vocabulary because what it, what happens to somebody who's a Christian nationalist who gets radicalized? What do they become? Do they just become a different kind of Christian nationalist? I'm saying we need to think about the spectrum because a lot of what's going on in American Christianity right now is, is the Christian supremacist leaders, especially NAR leaders, but there's others. Who are, are, are drawing people to their end of the spectrum. People who might be kind of sentimental Christian nationalists. Oh, I just want Christianity to be part of America. I want Christian values. And then they buy in to some of these more Christian supremacist messages and paradigms. They get more and more radicalized, more and more activated in politics. And, and I would also say that Donald Trump's lies about the 2020 election have been a huge 
radicalizing force that has pulled more and more Christians into these Christian supremacist ideologies. Because again, the, the, the campaign to promote those lies has been perpetrated by Christian supremacists. They've been the leaders in that. And they're, and so they're using, they're, they're kind of, it, it's, it's an interesting, like, um, they're, they're, they're both <laughs> kind of living off of each other, they're both parasitical in a certain way. Um, they, like Trump has ridden their coattails in terms of reaching their audiences and building up this evangelical base that is very, very fervent and very, very radicalized. But they have also ridden Trump's coattails to great popularity among American evangelicals. And there really is kind of a, a, a mutuality in their partnership that they both are getting something very, very useful to them out of it. Oh my gosh, I got so much more, but Jim, go in. Yeah, um, well, I, for me, there, there's a there's a bit of a, a trick um, built into the, the term Christian nationalism because the defense of it, and, and they say it out loud is, what's wrong with being a Christian or being a nationalist? But it's actually, at least for the, the part that, that I think you mostly focus on, it really means Christian nation a list, right? Which means they, they want a Christian nation. They want to change America from being a secular constitutional republic to a theocracy. And I've always felt that that, that term has sort of always hidden what the actual plan is and and you write about people like lance wall now who literally run entire you know programs uh, about how to take over the country for christianity um and that of course is the opposite of what the constitution um actually stands for um so uh, you know i i i i i'm interested very very interested to hear your your comments um, about that um I, i've um seen a lot of overlap as well between um orthodox christian orthodoxy um a lot of of cross sort of currents with uh russian orthodoxy um dugan um and and his whole sort of conflation of Christianity and far right ideologies. Um, I was just curious um, about your thoughts there and whether you saw any of those kind of currents um, either um, during January 6th or, and this is sort of my follow up, um, you know, what are you seeing now? Um, yeah. Yeah, so right. the, the term um, Christian nationalism, I, I, I come at this as a religious studies scholar. So um, the, the term Christian nationalism to me is not is neither positive nor negative. It's not a pejorative nor a compliment. It's just a descriptive term for what happens when people are blending their partisan political identities their, with their religious identities, right? How, how, do you, how do you kind of conflate belonging to a nation with belonging to a religion. And this is not unique to Christianity. This is not unique to the United States. We have Hindu nationalism, the Hindutva movement in India. You have Islamic nationalism, often called Islamism. You have right um, religious Zionism in Israel. You have Christian nationalism in Russia, right? You have Christian nationalism in Brazil. And those look different. So I, I would say that the, the American version of Christian nationalism is one species of this broader family of Christian nationalisms. And even there, I would even break it down more as, as, as you're kind of gesturing towards that there's a, there, there are a lot of different subspecies of American Christian nationalism. So there, so there is a, a Orthodox, capital O, Orthodox, right? More of an Eastern Orthodox, which people would use sometimes use the term. There are Catholic forms of Christian nationalism. And then there, within Protestantism, which is, has always been kind of the dominant strand of Christianity in the United States, there's a lot of different forms of, of Christian nationalism. I'm very much focused on this independent charismatic yeah. style of Christian nationalism, because in many ways it is the ascendant style. It's the one, like, it's not the most intellectual. It's not the one that has the most sway with Supreme Court leaders. The, the Catholics are, have, have a lot more input on the Supreme Court. But the this is the movement of Christian nationalism that puts people in the streets. 
This is the movement wow. of Christian nationalists that show up at these big protests that show up on January 6th, that show up in the Jericho marches. And so it is the one that has the, the most potential, I would argue, for actively pursuing violent ends. Right. A lot of a lot of the other forms of Christian nationalism tend in the U.S. tend to be more intellectual, tend to be more cerebral, tend to be more kind of, oh, we're, we're going to write books about this. The, the NAR and their followers in this broader kind of independent charismatic world, it's much more populist and experiential in its orientation. And it makes it a, a very, very potent weapon for politicization because a there are a lot of followers and b um it's 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 more detached from any sort of broader intellectual mooring um and so right if you've got prophets who are saying hey i've got a prophecy that they, they can take that any direction they want and as they've all kind of glommed on to trump and directed their prophecies positively towards him they never they never prophesy anything negative about trump as they've all kind of attached their prophecies to him their followers have become the most militant and ardent yeah. Christian Trump supporters. I want to talk about Christian Trumpism mm -hmm. and why you think that the evangelicals, etc., attach themselves to a man with no morals. Yeah. So let me let me tell the story of how that happened, actually, because it's not well known. Um, in when when Trump entered the presidential race in the summer of 2015, um, he he. The, the evangelical elites, the elites of the religious right, didn't want anything to do with him because he right, he's a he's a uncouth real estate billionaire who's been married three times, right? Who curses, who says two Corinthians instead of second Corinthians, who calls the communion wafer that little cracker, right? He he did not he did not connect with the evangelical elites. In fact, World Magazine, a, 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 a evangelical magazine, was running a tracking survey. Throughout 2015, every month, they were asking 100 evangelical elites, including people like David French, who are you supporting in the primary? And by December of 2015, six months after Trump entered the race, not one of those evangelical insiders were supporting Trump. But the evangelical grassroots were very attracted to Trump. And as from the start, from July of 2015, if you look at the polling, the white evangelicals are going towards Trump. Now, it's like 20% at that point because there's like 13 people in the race, but he's more he's getting more than anyone else. So Trump knows that he needs to win the evangelicals in order to win the primary. And so he reaches out to his own personal spiritual advisor, a woman named Paula White Kane, and they've been friends since 2002. And he says she's she's an independent charismatic televangelist apostle and mega church pastor, right? And, and a female preacher. So she is not a conventional evangelical. And so she starts reaching out to the people that she knows. And she doesn't know the A-listers from the, the James Dobson types, the Ralph Reed types. She knows the Lance Wallnow types. She knows the NAR types. And so those are the people she starts bringing to meet with Trump in the fall of 2015 at Trump Tower. There's a series of these gatherings with independent charismatic leaders invited by Paula White, to meet with Trump. And this is where Lance Wall now claims that he gets a prophecy that Donald Trump is a Cyrus. And we can unpack that if you want. But you, this is the beginning of all these prophecies about Trump. Those That group that meets with Trump becomes the nucleus of his evangelical advisors. Other people get added on over time, but that's the inner core of his evangelical advisors is coming out of these meetings. What happens though, is as you go through the 2016 primary, and as Trump is winning all these primaries, those people who were opposed to Trump, the evangelical elites, the, the religious right insiders who had been keeping him at arm's length suddenly want to get access. They start realizing he's going to be the candidate. He's winning all these primaries. And they have to go through Paula White. They have to go through the wow. inner circle. And this is a, a shift in the power of the religious right. Because suddenly you have these fringy outsiders like Paula White, like Lance Wall now, like these NAR folks who were not in the mainstream of the religious right who are suddenly being brought into the inner core. And I would compare it in many ways to what hap what's happened in the Republican Party, right? It, the, the, the people who were the, the Republican Party establishment 10 years ago, many of them wouldn't even call themselves Republicans anymore if they're even allowed to come to anything in the party, right? And instead, you've got these fringy outsiders, these Stephen Millers, these Steve Bannons, these Michael Flynn types who are now at the heart of the action, right? That same thing is going on in evangelicalism around Trump. These fringy kind of independent charismatic types who would have been laughed out of the room 15 years ago 
in the religious right are now at the center of the action. They are the frontline captains of the religious right who are driving the narratives, driving the leadership circles and offering theological paradigms that support and bolster Donald Trump. I've got one more question, but Hi-Fi, you jump in. My question is very simple. Um, I was raised Irish Catholic. Uh, I have family who is Jewish. I have family who is Muslim. And every one of us has expressed hurt at the way religion has been weaponized to cause this damage to people, not just in the United States, but globally. Yeah. What would you say to those people about these, these tricksters who abase religion for personal gain and how would you reassure them that there is something still good in religion? Well, um, religion has always been a mixed bag, right? Because religion, it, it, religion is it, it, it originates in that part of humanity that is trying to make meaning of the world. We're trying to make sense of the world, and so religion has has been a force of great beauty, of great insight of great power, of great kind of powerful experiences, of great co communal connection throughout history. It's been a, a force of great charity and care for the, the least in, in society. It's also been a force for great evil, right? I mean, I, 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 I'm a Christian. I'm, 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 I'm proud of being a Christian. I will admit, though, that, the, that Christianity has given us the Crusades, it has given us pogroms. It has given us anti-Semitism. It has given us Islamophobia. It has given us colonialism and all kinds of different forms of racism, right? Like, I, I, we don't need to be precious about Christianity. Christianity is a human tradition, and it's got all the weaknesses of humanity and all the strengths of humanity built into that. Where I come back to is the nature and the character of Jesus as a Christian. And, and that is where I think the NAR and their kin are, are, are furthest from mainstream Christianity. I think they're still Christians, but I think they are, they, they've lost sight of the Jesus of the Gospels. They've lost sight of Jesus, the, 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 the one who was executed by the empire, right? The one who stood against claiming earthly power every time that it was offered him. And they have said, well, now Christianity needs power. Now Christianity needs to have political power. And I, as a student of history, when Christians have had political power, it has rarely worked out well, either for Christians <laughs> or for society. I think Christianity is best lived on the margins. And because that's where Jesus and the early church were, was on the margins. And that's, that's the deep value system. And I think part of the strength of American Christianity has been the separation of church and state. Yes. Because it has, it has provided for religion to flourish not just Christianity, for all religions that have come to the United States or that have originated in the United States to flourish. This is what we talk about with religious pluralism, right? That separation between religion and state has allowed for this, this great proliferation of religious ideas and identities in the United States. It also protects the state from these attempts by religious majorities to assert a sort of hegemonic control. And, and the, the worry that I have right now about these groups is they, 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 they are willing to let go of the Constitution. They're willing to let go of the separation of church and state if it means more power for them. Thank you for that. That was actually a breathtaking response. And I wanted to vote for you in every single possible way I could vote for you. Uh, but, you know, encouraging everybody to buy your book is the next best thing. Um, you have written a page turner, really, about holy violence. And um, I'm going to read you a quote from the current Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven allows for aggression, and there's a time to every purpose under heaven. From the time of John the Baptist until today, the kingdom of God has been advancing by forceful men, and forceful men take hold of it. That's what the New Testament says. He said that in a radio interview uh, before he actually uh, became a, a, a congressman and before he became the speaker. How scared should Americans be? about somebody like that, that close to power, when you just said it doesn't usually work out good. And what in the next few weeks can we do to wake up the true Christians who have belief in true goodness and morality and believe in the golden rule of doing unto others to not fall for uh, what could potentially be the end of American democracy? I was just on another podcast this morning and I, I said something very similar to this. Do you want to know 
which elected official in the United States as a researcher into Christian extremism keeps me up most at night. It's not Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah. It's not <laughs> Jim J.D. Vance. It, it, it is Mike Johnson. Yeah. Mike Johnson is second in line to the presidency. He's yeah. the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He has come up and he's, he's been trained. He's, he's a creature of the religious yeah. right. He was a lawyer for the religious right. That was his career. That, that, that's, that's where he came from. He is very, very close to many extreme people. He's not part of the New Apostolic Reformation. Some people have tried to say that, but he's very much friends with many members of the New Apostolic Reformation. He partners with them. He's very close to an NAR apostle who is in his hometown in Shreveport in his district. Um, and, and in fact, Mike Johnson flies an appeal to heaven flag, this revolutionary war flag that is a symbol that, that has been appropriated by the New Apostolic Reformation as a symbol of spiritual war, as a symbol of spiritual revolution. Mike Johnson was given one of these flags by an NAR pastor, and he flies it outside of his congressional office. And so I, th and, and, and just uh, <laughs> to bring I another quote more recently, uh, even more recently than the quote that you just read, which again, he was just, he was citing the same verse that is the title of my book, right? Matthew eleven twelve. 12. But he, he we're just recently, he was on a prayer call led by Paula White and the National Faith Advisory Board, the most recent iteration of Trump's evangelical advisors. And he called in and he told the story on this prayer call. This was just a few weeks ago where he said, I was at Mar-a-Lago when the second assassination attempt happened on Donald Trump. And I spent several hours with him after that. And I assured him that this was the hand of God that was protecting him, that he, that, that, that is not an accident, that his life has been spared these two times. And he goes on to say on this call, I believe that God has once again chosen Donald Trump to lead our nation for another term. That is the Speaker of the House of Representatives making a theological statement that he believes that God has chosen Donald Trump for this office. And, and Mike Johnson has a not inconsequential role to play in the certification of this okay. that coming, upcoming election. And we did not, one of the things that did not happen at the end of 2020, when Trump was putting forward these election lies, you did not have congressional hearings about those that did not have the evidentiary standards of the mm -hmm. courts. Right. You did not have people like Jim Jordan pushing these narratives through congressional hearings. Mike Johnson could stand up congressional hearings about this stuff. He's in that position. And so I do truly worry that he is coming from a mentality and a mindset that is so enmeshed in these circles of kind of Christian nationalism, Christian extremism, Christian supremacy that and those are the people that are going to be in his ear. When, when he's making crucial decisions in the aftermath of this election. And I worry because he, I have not seen a single hint of him having a backbone when it comes to Trump, of standing up to Trump. He offers slavish compliments to Trump. He, he fawns over Donald Trump. And he was actually a part of organizing a legal brief sponsored by Republicans in Congress to support Donald Trump's election lies last time mm -hmm. in 2020. So I truly worry that he is, is a, could be a linchpin they could, they could exert a lot of pressure on to legitimize another round of election lies, another delegitimization of this election. We are over time. I would love one line about spiritual warfare, unless Jim or Hi-Fi has anything else that they want to jump in and say, this was such a brilliant no, no, interview. No. Please promise to come back. This yeah. interview was brilliant. One line about spiritual warfare and one thing you can say to the American voters about the stakes, uh, regardless of what their belief systems are. Yeah, so spiritual warfare, very common a belief um, across many parts of global Christianity, um, especially evangelicals. Many Catholics practice spiritual warfare, many Pentecostals. Um, and the basic idea, and this, this is rooted in some New Testament texts, is the idea that there are angels and demons, real angels and literal angels and demons, that are battling in this invisible spiritual realm all around us, and that those battles affect us. And, and so... Spiritual warfare is just this idea that Christians, through Christian practices like prayer, through singing worship songs, at the extreme end, even performing exorcisms, can participate in this invisible warfare. Very common idea. Now, when it comes to the NAR, though, they have created this other kind of paradigm of spiritual warfare that Peter Wagner called strategic level spiritual warfare. They believe wow. that the apostles and prophets, the leaders of the New Apostolic Reformation, have special authority. They are generals 
of spiritual warfare who both have the capacity and, and the mandate to organize and orchestrate mass campaigns of spiritual warfare, getting all kind of millions of Christians praying at the same time for the same cause, which is a big part of what's going on on January 6th, is it is the, what the Christian manifestations around the Capitol are largely spiritual warfare practices. Um, but they also have the capacity to cast out the apostles and prophets can cast out the high level demons, the, 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 the territorial spirits in their vocabulary. And just to illustrate just how crazy this can get. I was at a gathering with the NAR this past Saturday. Uh, they had tens of thousands of people on the National Mall. Che On, one of the most respected of the, the apostles in the New Apostolic Reformation, gave an apostolic decree, a declaration of spiritual warfare, where he said that <laughs> Kamala Harris is a type of a Jezebel. Donald Trump is a type of a Jehu. And this election, we are casting down Jezebel. And I declare that Donald Trump will win this election. That it is the will of God. Now, just to unpack what he's doing right there, the story he's referencing, Jezebel is this wicked queen in the Hebrew Bible, the most wicked of all the queens in the Hebrew Bible. And Jehu is the king who's appointed after her. Her husband Ahab dies. She's still alive. Jehu rides up on his horse and instructs, she's up in a tower with her servants. And he instructs their, her servants, throw her down. And they cast her out of the tower. Her body hits the ground. She's dead. Jehu tramples her with his horse, and then wild dogs come and eat her body. Wow. And, and, and the message of the story is Jezebel is so profane. She is such an unclean person that her, her memory must be wiped off the earth and her body must be reduced to dogdom. That's the, this is one of the most brutal stories in the Hebrew Bible. And this is the metaphor. This is the, the paradigm that, that Cheon is using to say Donald Trump is the Jehu. Kamala Harris is the Jezebel, and we are casting down Jezebel in this election. It, it was it was virtually a spiritual death order that he was issuing there in NAR theology. In the way that they think, he was saying she needs to be like Jezebel, right? That is the way that they think about spiritual warfare, and it's very very dangerous. Okay, just to, just last, last thought. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so let, thank you for explaining that. It's good for us to know this is happening so we can actually warn people but yeah. let's get to the part where you wake everybody up so we, we we are in a liberal democracy in america we have not always been a liberal democracy i'd say we more or less became a liberal democracy finally after the civil rights movement as you had the full inclusion and we are not a perfect liberal democracy there's there's all kinds of inequality there's all kinds of problems in the united states still but we are coming into an election where the future of that liberal democracy is on the line. And, and liberal democracies, and, and this has been known for centuries, have an Achilles heel. And that Achilles heel is populist authoritarianism. Because populist authoritarianism can use the tools, the freedoms afforded in a liberal democracy, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of expression, the freedom of gathering to attack liberal democracy. And the Republican party today has been taken over by a movement of authoritarian populists. That's what the MAGA movement is. And as we're coming into this election, this is not simply the most important election of our lifetimes. That, that, that's the old cliche. This is, I would argue, the most consequential election in American history since 1860, right? In, in the election of 1860, you had these two radically different trajectories. One that would continue the growth towards a pluralistic democracy, and one that would lead to further enslavement of people. That was the decision in 1860. And that is more or less akin to the decision we are facing right now. Will we continue this project, imperfect as our democracy is, of becoming more inclusive, of becoming more and more a, a, a society that is equal and, and, and is free for everyone? Or will we become a populist authoritarian state like Vladimir Russians, uh, Vlad Vladimir Putin's Russia, like Viktor Orban's Hungary, like what Jair Bolsonaro was trying to do in Brazil? Right. That Donald Trump is not unique. He is he is a, he fits the type of a populist authoritarian. The question is, will the American people reject that or not? And and we're we're facing a real. I I, I truly do not know the answer to that question. Nor do we, and it's why we do this work. Preach, Dr. Taylor. Yeah. Uh, Thank uh, you uh, so uh, much, Dr. Matthew Taylor. His book is The Violent Take It by Force. Everybody buy it, read it. Talk to your friends who are believers in various faiths. Let them know the true stakes. Thank you all.
Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.